Hello, everybody. I'm Beat Weibel, Chief IP Counsel of Siemens. Actually, I'm now working 30 years in IP in the industry, and you are listening to IP Fridays. Hello, and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. Welcome to episode 134 of IP Fridays. My co-host Ken Suzanne and I welcome you to this episode. Today's interview guest is Beat Weibel, who is the Chief IP Counsel and Group Senior Vice President at Siemens, one of the largest patent filers in the world, and we talk about patent quality. But before we jump into the interview, I have news for you. As usual, we have a lot of things happening at the Unified Patent Court, the UPC. It is now pretty clear that it will open its doors on 1st of April 2023 and that at least 17 countries can be reached by the UPC. Also, the judges have been announced. It is not very surprising that the UPC Court of Appeals will be headed by Klaus Krabinski, who is a presiding judge at the Federal Court of Justice in Germany and has been deeply involved in creating and drafting the rules of the Unified Patent Court. Then it is also not very surprising that the two divisions of the central, the, the two central divisions will be headed by two French ladies, Miss Florence Boutin and Melanie Bessot. The full list can be seen at unified-patent-court.org. And you might be surprised by some of the positions. For example, I was very surprised that the experienced judge from the regional court in Düsseldorf, Sabine Klepsch, was assigned to the local division in Hamburg. But go to the list yourself and see who has been assigned a judge at the UPC. I also want to mention a post of the EOIPO on LinkedIn. The EOIPO has posted um, an invalidity case in a design invalidity case where a social media post of the pop star Rihanna, which received more than 300,000 likes and a lot of comments and a lot of media coverage, constituted solid evidence and effective and sufficient disclosure of a prior design. Rihanna had worn um, sneakers in a post um, dated 2014 and Puma SE has filed for the community design in 2016. And this social media post was um, prior art in invalidity proceedings and the design was uh, held invalid. So now let's jump into the interview with Beat Weibel. Today's interview guest is Beat Weibel. If you don't know who Beat Weibel is, he is the Chief IP Counsel and Group Senior Vice President of Siemens. But also in the context of today's topic, I want to mention that he's also President of the VPP. That is a German Association of IP Professionals as well as president of FEMIP, which is the Association of European Industry Patent Councils and Patent Attorneys. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Hello, Rolf, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here the second time, so to speak, about the one of my most important and beloved topics. Yes, thank you so much for being back uh, so quickly. <laughs> In our last interview, we already had briefly talked about uh, patent quality, and that seems to be a hard topic of yours. Um, why do you think this is uh, increasingly important in today's patent world? Yeah, I think there are two main reasons. First of all, we are living in a digital world, in a more and more digital world with a lot of ecosystems platform systems, etc. And 
as I probably mentioned last time already, IP rights are in, important to document and prote protect its intellectual contribution to this ecosystem. And actually, I feel that intellectual property rights are the only measure we have to uh, protect and document one's uh, intellectual achievement and intellectual contribution to such, to such an ecosystem. So therefore, we also see ever raising numbers of patent applications. The unitary patent is, in, is ahead of us. And therefore, I th think we need to focus even more on quality than quantity because these IP rights and in particular patents give us uh, exclusive right as we now know with which we can take direct influence in contrast to being faster, quicker, uh, better, etc. We can take direct influence on, on our competitors and on competition and for that reason for me it's clear that we have to focus on uh, quality. And the second uh, reason is maybe a kind of professional pride and obligation that uh, we contribute with high quality things and that we also in, in the patenting processes, we try to foster for the best quality possible. Yes. Um... And that leads to my next question. Um, if we talk about patent quality, we have to talk about how to measure patent quality. Do you have a way to measure patent quality? And if yes, um, if you measure patent quality, do your measurements match your outcomes when you are in force patents? Of course, I know that patents are typically only maybe a tenth of patents or even less are really enforced. Uh, but you have um, a big data set, I would say. Um, you file a lot of patents and you enforce also patents. Um, do you see that there is a correlation? So first part of your question, what tool do we use? Um, I don't want to make advertisement here, but I think the tool and the database is so, so well known that it doesn't really matter whether I also mention it, we use patent sites since many, many years to measure the quality of our portfolio and in particular the development of the quality of our portfolio, which is in my view a very important feature of, of patent site. And there I have to say we, we see a quite good match. We feel that uh, the these independent measurements goes exactly in the right uh, in the right direction, and we indeed do see that. For individual patents, it becomes I have to confess and say it becomes uh, much more trickier. So not always uh, the 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 best or the highest ranked patents are the ones that we can enforce. Because honestly, the question if you enforce a patent is not, or the freedom you have if you enforce a patent is not that you can just pick the best one. You have to pick the one that is infringed. And that's sometimes not really the best one. Uh, and therefore, uh, for individual patents, I have to say the, the match is probably less good as than it is for the portfolio. Um, one question I have in this context, um, you just mentioned that patent site is very good for measuring the patent quality of a portfolio. Um, do you have um, some additional KPIs or some additional uh, measurement um, factors um, when, you, when it comes to individual patents? What, what do you look at? What kind of um, features or what kind of measurement uh, quality indicators, let's say, do you use when you look at individual patents or do you do that? <laughs> yes, we do that. Uh, we do that on a regular basis. We do that in, in first instance, so to speak, when we talk about the invention, 
whether uh, it, we should go for a patent application or not. But we do, do it in a second step also when we talk about uh, filing subsequent filings after the priority application. And we do it in a third step, even in a third step, when we talk about the maintenance of the portfolio, meaning the management of the portfolio where we sort out unused patents, uh, patents that have not such a high value, etc. And there we use a number of KPIs. It's quite a long list, actually. But I would like to point out two um, KPIs that are very important for your questions, which is enforceability. That means also the legal uh, validity of uh, patent applications, the scope of the protections, the, the broader the scope of protection, of course, is of the claims, the better it is, is enforceable and also detectability, whether it covers something that you can prove in uh, litigation or whether it's a, a completely hidden feature that you cannot prove in, in litigation. So that would score less well if you have uh, such a hidden features. So these two additional elements are taken into consideration in our uh, IP management system. Thank you so much. Um, that is very interesting for me also to hear as a practitioner on the other side of the table, basically. <laughs> and um, maybe that gives us also some insight, the, the practitioners in private practice, basically, uh, to deal with uh, patent quality. Um, so one, the main topic of today is that you have recently initiated and signed an industry patent quality charter. And I think you are one of the people who, who first uh, initiated this with uh, some colleagues in industry. Um, maybe tell me, tell me more about this initiative and especially when did you start thinking about this charter and who are the other players who also are interested in this topic and also signed the patent quality, the industry patent quality charter and who started this initiative with you? Yeah, that's, uh, I'm happy to do so. And actually it was created, so to speak, in a, one of these uh, sessions where, that we had about the Patent Modernization Act in Germany, where it was about the um, proportionality of the injunctive relief. And as you remember, there was a kind of a parallel discussion in, in public and in, in, the, in the papers uh, about patent quality. And in one of these meetings we had about the injunctive relief, the focus also shifted on patent quality. And there was this saying again that 80% of the patents are trash because 80% of the uh, patents litigated before the German patent court are amended or nullified. And I said, come on, I cannot believe that. I think we discussed that also in the last podcast because first of all, the, the set is too narrow because only uh, very few patents are litigated in front of the German patent court. Therefore, you cannot draw any conclusions to the entire population of, of patents. And by the way, I mentioned, I remember that very well, I feel we as industry have a self-obligation to strive for quality because we are profitable uh, companies, we have our stakeholders, we have our shareholders, and we have to deliver, etc. Therefore, we don't have any incentive whatsoever to go for trash patents, and we have no incentive to misuse the system, etc. And then I mentioned that just in, in, in one of these discussions, and amazingly enough, everybody independent whether he or she was uh, for the um, proportionality of the injunctive relief or against it, agreed. And I said, okay, looks like we have an issue here. <laughs> and that was kind of the, the starting point. And then uh, this, let's say this, this year, this summer, um, there was another 
trigger point where we where I got the feeling once again, to be very honest, that the European Patent Office is taking uh, only formalistic uh, approach on patent quality. If you look at the presentations on, on patent quality, you see uh, charts about timeliness of the search report, efficiency of the examination, etc. That's fine, but that's, in my view, that's not patent quality. That's maybe process quality, internal process quality of the European Patent Office. And what I feel, I have been repeating this topic that we from industry point are need to rely on valid, good, valuable, enforceable, licensable, otherwise usable patents. This is not really heard by the European Patent Office. And therefore, I thought now we need to uh, act ourselves and create an initiative that we call the Industry Patent Quality Charter to convince the European Patent Office what we think about patent quality and that we think differently, that we completely think differently. We don't think in terms of internal process optimization and uh, efficiency, but we, we talk about content of the patents. So that also reflects the two objectives that we have with this charter. First of all, I mean, that's more based on the root cause of the charter. We would like to give to society and to the public a positive signal that we as companies, as industry, have no uh, incentive whatsoever to, to invest in trash patents and bad patents, etc. That we strive to have optimal processes from our end and to prove that the charter is also drafted as a self-obligation of the in, uh, of the companies that sign this this charter and the second objective is to force the european patent office to enter with us a continued dialogue to improve patent quality in our sense because we cannot do that alone. We can do it from our end, but we need to be completed with uh, measures at the European Patent Office in particular. Okay, and um, so you already mentioned that you had some um, peers basically who, uh, who <laughs> support you in this uh, effort. Um, can you tell us uh, like who would be the players who were interested in this industry patent quality charter to get this on the way? Yeah, I mean, this is a moving target, so to speak. We started with uh, 10 companies, and I'm really happy that we have a very diverse uh, group of companies that joined the charter from pharmacy over telecom, uh, chemical to technological companies like Siemens, but also uh, other companies like Procter and Gamble, uh, which are in a completely different field. So we have at the moment we have Bayer, Ericsson, HP, Nokia, Procter and Gamble, Qualcomm, Roche, Siemens, Syngenta, Vodafone. That were the starting members, and based on the publication uh, on LinkedIn in uh, early in October, um, NTU uh, joined. Deutsche Telekom joined and Volvo joined. So we have now already enlarged our <laughs> group of companies even into the car manufacturing uh, field. And that, that's great. And I can tell you, first of all, I will publish that today, probably uh, to this afternoon on LinkedIn. And then there are other companies already in the pipeline that need to get management and communication approval first. So we will continue to publish the uh, members of the charter on a continuous basis so that the public is informed who, also, who signs uh, this charter. So these are the one of the biggest, uh, some of the biggest uh, patent filers with the European Patent Office. 
but uh, I, I recognize that some uh, one important group is missing, um, especially um, big larger patent filers from Asia. Um, did they hear about this patent charter or is this more like a thing about the European Patent Office or do you reach out to these uh, patent filers like Huawei or ZTE or Japanese patent filers or so? Actually, I didn't uh, reach out to them yet, but I'm happy to do so. Um, and of course, they are, if you're listening to your podcast, they are welcome to join me. Just drop me an email. I would be very interested in having, for example, Samsung on, on the charter or Huawei, ZTE, Japanese companies. Um, there's no rocket science be, behind who is on the charter now. It is, these were more personal, professional contacts we as the charter members had where we tried to expand it and it's open for every company. It's a company initiative and it's deliberately a company in initiative because we feel we as companies, as industry are directly concerned about the patent quality of the uh, in, in Europe because on the one hand, we are applicants, yes, of course, we are patent owners, but we are also the famous third party. So if somebody is concerned, um, confronted with patent rights, then it's exactly the same one. So actually, this term third party is a, is a bit misleading. There is not an anonymous third party in Europe that could be confronted with patent rights, it's exactly the same as the applicants are, are because on the ones, uh, on once you are on applicant side, patent owner side, and once you are, are on the defendant side. So there is not really a, a different third party than the first parties, whatever you count it. Right. Um, the European Patent Office presented its own patent quality charter in September. So <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> How yeah. does this initiative differ from your initiative? And is there a different thrust to this initiative? You, you briefly mentioned different goals uh, of the European Patent Office, but uh, maybe you can talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, I mean, if I'm, I take the liberty to be very frank here. If you read the EPO quality charter, then I personally feel it's very general. It's not kind of binding, has no specific means. To be very frank, I think you could exchange your organization name, name and then you could use it for any other organization. So it's very general. And at max, I would expect from the EPO quality charter that it continues to take this formalistic approach uh, that I mentioned earlier, where margins of the documents are checked, where the list of designations has to be correct, where timeliness and efficiency of the process are in the focus. And that's all important, I would say, to have uh, a, a, a possibility to get rid of the backlog, to have smooth processes, etc. But that's not, in my view, or in our view, I have to say, it's not patent quality as we understand it. It's process quality, examination process, uh, efficiency, but not patent quality, which is much more content driven. So I have to say, and I know I'm criticizing the, here the European Patent Office, I got the feeling that a lot of the measures that were issued in the last years had a main purpose of internal optimization of their processes and not uh, considering what we as users, we as financiers of the system, because the European Patent Office is 100% user and fee financed what we expect and what we need from the European Patent Office. Because as I mentioned earlier, for the reasons that I uh, described, we need valuable, enforceable, licensable, valid patents. And um, 
So therefore, we are really talking two different things. And one goal of the initiative of the charter is to bring us together, the charter members and the EPO, on one table where we can discuss that and together bring it forward so that we improve the quality. Okay, that were very clear words. Thank you so much <laughs> for being very frank and open. Um, what in your opinion, your personal opinion, will be the most important drivers to improve patent quality in the future? So I think you have to distinguish on what we can do from our side. And we try to write that down in our charter as a self-obligation. So, for example, that we focus for the patent applications on the really important inventions that are uh, um, necessary for creating innovations for the companies that we represent and that create a sustained value to, our, to improve our companies and our customers' products and services. So that's maybe at the beginning. But then we also, as patent prof professionals, should pay attention that we um, draft the patent ap applications clearly with a well-defined scope of protection. We should avoid misleading and inconsistent wording so that we have a, a good basis document that can be examined, searched and examined by the European Patent Office or by any patent office in general. And what is also important at the afterground, so to speak, and coming to the examination process in a minute, what is important afterground is that you have a kind of portfolio management process where you sort out uh, unused patents, uh, uh, unvaluable patents, patents that don't serve your needs anymore. That is also important to keep the portfolio slim and to keep the number of patents slim. So that we can do from our end. And in that respect, we have created this charter where the companies in as a kind of self-obligation subscribed to do so. On the patent office side, first of all, I think it's necessary that we get complete searches, searching the complete set of claims, because um, based on these search reports, we take a decision where to file further to file in different uh, countries, to a PCT application, whatever is uh, uh, foreseen. And if we don't get complete searches because the search is stopped because of a formalistic uh, argument, for example, or technicality argument, then it's useless, so to speak. And the same is true for the examination. That means the examination of novelty and inventive step. We always need complete examinations of all claims because otherwise we don't know where we stand. We cannot steer our investment. And in order to do so, we feel that the examiners should be incentivized in a way to exactly deliver such searches and examination reports. And they should not be incentivized to deliver them in time and efficiently. That's also necessary, but that shouldn't be the focus in order to improve quality. And then I think we should also, or patent office should also strive as far as possible that there are consistent approaches and consistent judgments on all levels, meaning from the examination division to the opposition division, if you have an opposition to the board of appeal, because otherwise legal security, uh, predictability of the, of the processes is just not possible. And uh, so in a nutshell, it's important that the, your, uh, the a patent office focuses on content as well as we try and not on formalistic uh, aspects of the patenting processes and that we get away from 
uh, celebrating even more patent applications, more patent applications, we should focus on quality instead of quantity in a nutshell. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, that was very interesting. And um, especially for our listeners in the patent field, of course, uh, most of our listeners come from the US. So there's a lot of discussion at the moment about uh, patentability and patent quality in the US. So I, that might be a very interesting discussion for our US listeners from the US. Um, maybe the companies who hear this want to join the initiative, the Industry Patent Quality Charter. Um, so where can, if they want to do that, and, and also, of course, the, the patent um, applicants from Asia, um, where can they find out more about the Industry Patent Quality Charter? So we published it on LinkedIn. Um, actually, we haven't yet a website uh, about the charter. That's something to be considered. But the information can be found on LinkedIn and how to get a member. Just drop me a message on LinkedIn and then we will get in, into contact directly. And um, as I said, it's open for any company. And I, of course, would be very pleased to see even further companies joining us. We will publish new companies regularly on LinkedIn as well. And as a second measure, we plan to have a round table among the charter members, but hopefully also with uh, participants from the offices, from the German patent office or from French or uh, UK patent office, from the Euro patent of European patent office, where we want to openly discuss uh, these uh, things of patent quality and what our expectations towards patent offices are in terms of their processes in terms of their searches and examinations. Okay, thank you so much for being on today's show. And I very much hope that you have success with your intentions to grow your membership for the Industry Patent Quality Charter and that you will have roundtables with the European Patent Office, with the German Patent Office and the other patent offices. Um, that would be important for the patent industry, let's say, for both the patent owners as well as the patent attorneys in private practice and the patent offices to have a time in the future where we can improve patent quality together uh, with all these forces. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you and thank you for your good questions and for your support. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. We would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at ipfridays.com or on iTunes or stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at ipfridays.com slash feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can go to ipfridays.com slash iTunes, and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast or even have comments within the next episode, please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com slash voicemail. You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.